Welcome. So joyed to be here today with two extraordinary pioneers of permaculture. Maya Angelou advised us to be present in all things and thankful for all things. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity today to be in service and to help share the message of permaculture, inspiring people to take positive action in the unique context of their own lives. I just got back from a trip to Ireland and it's really stuck with me. And one of the Irish proverbs that I've been meditating on says, your feet will bring you to where your heart is. So a heartfelt welcome to all of those joining us across time and space, wherever and whenever it is that you listen to this recording. Uh, write your name, location, and any permaculture related web links you wanna share in the comments. Some people might wanna grab a notebook or sketch pad. We certainly encourage note taking, art making, doodling, designing during this experience. You know, See what emerges from your creative mind and look for bridges between what's being said and your own life. Others may listen to this while gardening or cleaning the house, you know, working or walking in nature. Consider recording any ideas or action items that come to mind during this experience. It would be so wonderful if you had, you know, tangible action items that came away after this. So uh, Maddie and Rosemary can talk more about their present and future work later in this dialogue. But for now, I thought I'd give them each a short introduction. Wow, I am joyed to be here with two of my most inspiring teachers. Maddie Harland is a force of nature, <laughs> editor and co-founder of Permaculture Magazine, a long running international publication in print, digital and online formats. She co-founded Permaculture Publications, which has produced many books on sustainability, homesteading, practical ecological solutions, including her incredible book, Fertile Edges, Regenerative Land, Culture, and Hope, as well as Rosemary Morrow's book, Earth User's Guide to Teaching Permaculture. She's also a co-founder of the Sustainability Center in Hampshire, UK, a thriving immersive learning center where I first met Maddie during a series of courses in 2015 that included Rosemary Morrow. Maddie is an activist, gardener, teacher, community leader, wife and mother of two daughters. Some of her prolific work can be found at the website permaculture.co.uk and we'll include more links in the show notes. Rosemary Morrow is also a force of nature. Working extensively with farmers and villagers, she teaches permaculture to people in some of the most intense living conditions. Dedicating herself to supporting refugees, she works with a team of teachers to bring hope empowerment, knowledge, purpose, and practical skills like growing food to many people in need across the world. Her extraordinary service continues to work where it counts and uplift people to aid work and to permaculture learning. Rosemary is the author of Earth User's Guide to Permaculture, which I use as a reader on my permaculture design certificate courses, and her book Training Permaculture Teachers is a free download. Some of her work can be found at the website Blue Mountains Permaculture Institute dot com dot au. So wow, uh, you have both been such a massive inspiration for me. Your work has really helped me to get on and stay on the permaculture path. So I'm inspired to hear you share with our growing global community today. Maybe we start with uh, Maddie with the first question, what is going well in permaculture and how is it evolving? I was having a long conversation um, with Steve Jones, who runs an organization called Sector 39. And he works a lot on the ground in Africa with African community leaders um, in three different countries. And he also works in the community in South Wales as well. And he was telling me that what really works and what's doing really well um, in his uh, observations of uh, projects and people in Africa is just really going back to basics. So encouraging people um, to grow home gardens that work, that provide nutrition, um, particularly for women and children, and then other people seeing how effective um, these techniques are for composting, uh, rainwater harvesting, building soil, 
and how it changes. It's a game changer in nutrition. So instead of eating once a day, um, families eat three times a day, making a huge difference and eating such a broad variety of foods. And inevitably, people looking on think, I want some of this. And so from very small beginnings of small communities, suddenly a thousand people uh, are wanting to know more about how to make home gardens. And then it's, you know, spreading out over entire bioregions. And this is what's really working um, from Steve's personal experience um, and observation. And also simple things like smokeless um, rocket stoves um, and other designs just built with mud to radically reduce the need to forage wood um, and to clean, cook cleanly, not use kerosene, uh, makes a huge dis difference to lung disease um, and, and it stops deforestation as well, or certainly slows it down dramatically. So, so small techniques like this on a really grounded practical level. In European countries, uh, like the UK, we don't have um, access to land in the UK in the same way that even people have access to small plots of land in Ireland. We have a thousand year tradition of, of being unlanded, the peasantry being enclosed and fenced out of land. So we've had to develop our permaculture in a really different way, which is much more about um, small gardens and finding uh, community spaces and building community gardens on marginal lands on, in the city and building community projects around uh, therapeutic gardening and bringing in uh, people in the community who uh, are suffering um, from mental illness or, or who have um, other, other problems and, and so using permaculture as an agency of positive change and integration of, of the margins, literally of society. Um, so we have these different levels. We have a bit of regenerative agriculture and there is a, a growing and strong movement with uh, farming, with the Land Workers Alliance to develop um, permaculture techniques on the land in a more broad scale way. But, as yet, access to land is, is difficult here because it, you, know, you need to be a millionaire to just to buy a few acres over here. The housing prices have just gone crazy since COVID uh, and with people moving to rural areas. So we have to see permaculture out in, in very different ways um, to perhaps in, in other countries in the world. And I'll probably leave it at that for the moment, see what Rosemary says. I think that's fascinating because I'm always dealing now with people who have no access to land or little access to land. And I think permaculture is going to die unless it can do something about that because growing food and caring for land and keeping it clean has been part of what and that's the whole basis, care of the earth comes first. So I'm really interested in the fact that even a country like England that you think of with all these small farms is actually suffering from a land shortage. People are unlanded, as Noam Chomsky says. So we're not, exact, not exactly like Palestine, but it's a growing thing and will be in the future. I guess I'd just like to start with the story. In 2017, I was standing in a refugee camp, which you can imagine of just tents and tents and tents. So 50,000 people in Iraq and I looked through the barbed wire fence and the electric fence on top and the moat and I thought I'm in the Tigris Euphrates, the fertile crescent. This is where the whole world was started and was able to develop arts and crafts. Here, where these rivers ran fertile and well watered, the hanging gardens of Babylon were not far away and today it's shifting sands just saying. I couldn't find trees to show people. I couldn't find a forest to show people. I got permission to take people out of the camp in a bus into Irville, the capital, where we went to a park where there were five species of trees, one of which was eucalypt. 
I mean, it was extraordinarily impoverished and degraded. And remembering that people used to write about the grapes and the waters running clean and the wonderful willows hanging over the river and birds singing. I mean, it's all the poetry of that time. The biblical poetry, even going back to the Psalms, if you read them, it's all there. And then in 2017, a desert. That's been my experience for the last 20, 30 years, wherever I've gone, and I have often been there earlier. So that course, I taught it, people are enthusiastic. On my way back to teach teachers and get it launched within the camp, and Iraq shut down Kurdistan. I spent 10 days, 12 days, 13 days on a sofa in Vietnam waiting to get a visa that I didn't get because they closed down Kurdistan that voted for autonomy. There was a project I consider had failed, absolutely collapsed. Then I got in touch with the chap from World Vision um, International who'd been helping me. And he said, by the way, your project, some of those Syrian refugees have gone home now to Syria and they're using what you taught them. Some of them are still teaching them in the camp and some um, are actually going to start teaching a program in Romania. So five, six years later, this camp had seeded three significant projects. What I'm learning is I'll write something for some funding write the outcomes, five, six years later, which is the assessment we do, it's gone and exploded, it's left the camp. So from Turkey, a couple of the volunteers in the Turkish course with refugee women in Turkey, mainly Syrians, they went to Sudan and they went to the Congo and they were doing work there and they're now back in France. What has happened is those refugee camps, probably like every other course, except I haven't followed it to this degree, has tended to seed other projects and things that were actually unthinkable because you couldn't imagine that 30,000 people would be settled in Romania. Well, perhaps you could, but it was unpredictable to write into a project proposal. Someone would say, prove it. So we didn't try to look at the number of people in a camp with a garden. We tried to look at the transformation of the camp. And we're getting that data in now. It's very, very interesting. So I guess what's going well now is whatever we're doing, especially as teachers, tends to spin off in ways that were unpredictable. And I don't think I've ever seen a negative result. And I think that's extraordinary. Look, permaculture's on the cusp. It's going to live or die because of COVID. If there another round of COVID comes through and we can't meet face to face, then we have to turn to the Asian and African models of how they're teaching, which is so dramatic and so fascinating, and see how it's evolving there. Also, I think the syllabus we've taught hasn't been 100% suitable for um, many of the countries of the global south we've been working with and I realized that uh, <laughs> it's in vocabulary it's not in concepts it's not even in principles it's much more in, in the details and the way of teaching so what happens is as usual or as often happens something comes out of the west anti-slavery anti-capital punishment started by a group of white fellows and then it translates and is picked up and carries worldwide. And it is what I call indigenized. So talking of indigenized, can I just say, what am I? Nalawa Mitika, which is the local Darug language for please come in, sit down and join us. Beautiful. Wow. I'm. It's exciting to hear about all the new possibilities that permaculture is inspiring people to, to come up with and apply. I really see people everywhere skilling up and radically relocalizing. There's not as much movement uh, around for many people. And of course, online courses have seen exponential growth in permaculture, including uh, permaculture entering into the mainstream media, like all these podcasts and broadcasts like this one, and even big news channels. So the word permaculture has become a household name in many ways, you know, far more than it was in 2003 when I finished my first diploma with, with Bill Mollison. 
So, you know, I want to share a quote from David Holmgren, the co-originator with Build of Permaculture. He said, the more radical our change agenda is, the more simple our starting points need to be. So I, this leads right into our next question, which maybe Maddie wants to start with is, what can be done to support permaculture to be more effective? Well, first of all, um, we, you know, Rosemary mentioned uh, to indigenize something. So we need to get away from the white fellas teaching all over the world and empower and enable people to take these techniques back into their own communities and for community leaders to teach their own people uh, permaculture techniques within their own context, their own language and their own conditions. And the, where we can be useful perhaps is, is to support that and as, as Rosemary does and myself, doing with the permaculture magazine prize is to try and use a flow of funding to to kickstart that and very strongly hold those values in the funding criteria um, and i've been working with lush a lot uh, uh, in the last few years um, and we've decided to combine their um, david for well they're goliath and i'm david um, but forces with the Lush Spring Prize and the Permaculture Magazine Prize to really ensure that those values and those criteria are seeded out in, into what we do together. Um, so that's that's just one aspect. Um, for us also, it's about persistence. So you said it, um, permaculture is mainstream. I no longer have to explain what permaculture is in every other sentence when I go and do something. People seem to know about it now. And it's more about getting it seen and recognized as something highly effective um, with decision makers on a local community level, but also on a national and international level. So showing up um, and understanding that permaculture holds a very subtle dimension of hope. So we may look at something like COP26 and think, well, this is a total waste of time because, you know, they're saying that the bankers are going to be the next activists and all this kind of total nonsense. Um, but actually behind the scenes, there are hundreds of activists permaculturists, indigenous people in the green zone, really speaking up and, and making media and spreading the world word about these solutions. So I think the more people know about the possibilities of carbon sequestration in soil, in biomass, in marine permaculture, the better. Because at the moment when you're a young person looking out into the world like my my daughter, who I was speaking to today, who listened to Obama's speech at COP, she's actually very angry and disempowered by what's going on in the world, even though she's been marinated in permaculture since birth. Um, and we, we just need to keep on saying, hey, these solutions exist. They're actually proven. They're proven anecdotally um, on a huge scale now over you know, thousands and thousands of projects, hundreds of thousands or more people. They're also academically proven. So we've got the work coming out of Lebec, um, La Ferme du Bec au Halloin in, in France that is, has been working with two academic institutes, actually proving the level of carbon sequestration in the soil of permaculture gardens and, and things like that, that that are showing that that level is far, far higher than anticipated. And it's not the agroforestry systems that are sequestering carbon. It's the raised mulch beds that are locking it up and they're bio-intensive as well. And they're providing nutrition and they're creating economically viable farms. 
um, which are very, very small scale. And two thirds of that land is left for wildlife to, to be the biodiversity driver. And this is all permaculture design. And, and so we know it works. And somehow we've got to get past this sort of miserable narrative of, of tech being the solution and carbon capture and the fact that we can only transition out of shell, which has actually got the far but carbon footprint of Russia, can only transition out of fossil fuels by 2050 because it needs them, quote, to finance the transition. I mean, that's just like saying, I'm going to kill my baby very slowly now because um, I need to do it in this way um, to move to the next phase of my life. It's just an insanity, a crazy way of thinking. And we've got other solutions that are very, very powerful. We need to get this out. But let's not be naive about the difficulty. I mean, at COP26, as I speak tonight, there are 503 lobbyists from the fossil fuel lobby at COP26. That is more people for that lobby than some of the small island states, at least four or five small countries put together. I mean, this is a vast financial lobby. It's akin to the cigarette lobby that denied that cigarettes caused cancer. It's still going on. It's ludicrous, but it's still going on. So I think for us permaculturists, we, we've kind of just got to stay in our power and our knowledge that this stuff really works, that this stuff changes lives and it changes lives all over the world. It, it, whatever society we're in, there is a way of adapting and designing and refining permaculture techniques because they're based on nature and the observation of natural systems, which is the biggest, deepest wisdom, really, that is under, you know, in front of our eyes. And, and because it works, we just have to keep holding on to that and hold on to these subtle dimensions of hope that we do have answers, not simplistic ones, not ones that don't require, as Rosemary was saying, you know, we need to refine what we're doing. We need to make it better. We need to constantly work on what we're doing and grow our understanding of it. But we have to stay in that place of, of empowerment and hope. Brilliant. On to you, Ro. Okay. Well, I think globally and I think as a teacher, as much as a doer, and I thought, well, one measure of carbon sequestration in my soil would just be the number of earthworms if you went out there now. You know, it, it's sort of more earthworms than soil at the moment. I might don't need a worm farm anymore. Well, I tend to think a bit globally. So I guess what I'm thinking about is partly what we teach. So this might be quite relevant for you all. But in effect, something we must be teaching is some of the more traditional things that people have done in very hard and challenging environments. So if we look at the Marsh Arabs of Iraq, who are now reinstated, and we look at Bangladesh with floating gardens, given that probably most of the world's deltas will go underwater, and that's one of the wicked problems that permaculture is only able to act as palliative rather than having all solutions. So early in permaculture, people would say, oh gosh, permaculture will solve everything. I think there was a moment but I think we've flipped that. And what we can do now is provide the models and the inspiration and the movement to change, but to do that. So we need to also, I have put it in my new book, put in models of dry climate, Middle Eastern traditional methods, which have lasted for thousands of years, usually till wars blew them up. Things such as in dry climates, whether you're talking about California or Namibia, South Africa, Western Australia, those zones that are going to get drier, parts of the Mediterranean. Water's got to be covered if it's underground because that's the only way you can cope with evaporation. So the idea of the open ponds in these countries, sort of Sepp Holtz is fine for the mountains of Austria, isn't good for Spain, 
dry land because the evaporation is higher than the rainfall. So how can we include some of the really enduring methods that have been used in these countries? I've tried to include them as much as I can. Also being relevant to the world's population by constantly without driving home global warming and climate change, but constantly saying for a changeable future, you have to be more flexible in your thinking. And here are some of the things you need to think of. Um, I think we need to think very, very closely now about marine systems, because a third of the world's population, 3 billion live somewhere near the coast and permaculture hasn't served them well whether you're in Malaysia or Britain, or whether you're Portugal, where you can see the coasts collapsing in New Zealand. So also understanding every design that you do, everything you do on land, even a thousand miles from the sea, is probably going to end up in the sea. The Hawaiians say the ocean begins at the top of the highest hill. So eventually, it's going to make its way down. So that's all the pollutants and all the sewage and all the everything ends up there. So every designer living a thousand or 2000 kilometers inland needs to be considering what's going to be the impact of my work on the ocean, which seems trivial. So I've tried to use the zoning of permaculture zero to five, starting with the port of zero filthy ports with shipping and bilge and bile and all the things that they have and ships and chaos. And then look at moving out from there a series of zones of how people could see themselves on the coast. And then they'd have to apply their local zoning knowledge. But using the permaculture design methods and principles to a situation that hasn't quite been used before. But actually 70% of the world is out there and we haven't given it enough attention in permaculture. So I think that that is something that would make us more effective in saying, you know, it's going to end up in the sea. You know, you've got that much runoff, you put it all in a big pipe, where's it going to go? It will do damage on the way. Um, another thing I think that permaculture has always said, let's not work with others, let's stand alone and produce a beautiful example of an alternative. I agree with that, but I think when I looked at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the whole 17 of them, um, I found many of them covered the areas that we require for ecological literacy and permaculture. And some of the things I wouldn't agree with, but I think we need to talk the same language. And the other thing is about planetary boundaries. You know, those planetary boundaries, I checked them against with Holmgren and Mollison, we're talking about as world problems in the 70s. And the deforestation, soil loss, climate change, they're all there, biodiversity loss. And I think the idea of a global bound, planetary boundaries is very good because if you break that boundary, it's almost like bursting the balloon, isn't it? Pop, there goes another hole in the planetary boundary. You're eventually going to get the whole system will readapt in ways that are so unfavorable to us, as the ocean does. And people often say the ocean's malign or the weather's terrible. It actually isn't, it's responsive. And I think we need to get the concept in permaculture of reciprocity and responsiveness back. We've got our first observe and interact or observe and adapt, whatever one you like but it needs to understand that reciprocity very very closely that because we do something has that response and it's a way to understanding problems as well so I think it doesn't hurt to have and talk the same language and along with that we are just the permaculture for refugees project I started is just put in an application to be listed as a permaculture project with the UN now, all of you can do that. We are going to show, send you out a hand, this is building on Maddie's stuff, a note on how to register your project with the UN SDGs. Then the UN will say there's 30 
40, 50 years really from the 70s through to now of projects on the ground everywhere from, you know, Nasana in India to the people in Chile to Peronopolis in Brazil to John Nazira. They're there. They've been going nearly 50 years. We've all got grey white hair, some of us who were there in the beginning. And now there are thousands and thousands of examples. And one way to get them known is to get them up there on the UN. So I think that would make us more effective. Um, I think we need to absolutely prioritise our relationships with nature. I'm not sure about being wardens and, and things, you know, that hasn't worked very well yet. Um, I think we have to include fairly early the Sendai framework for disasters. Not that we're making it a negative course, but we're broadening people's ability to deal with change and unpredictability. And the other thing we have to do, well, I've got a list, but I'm not going to give them all, it's a secret. <laughs> um, we've usually done with water on farmland and domestic areas. I really think we have to do with water under the soil. Every design, anyone does for me now, I say, show me how you're get banking it in the aquifers, in the water table. We're not just talking about the soil and the humus. We're talking about actually putting water back into those deeper wells. And can we act for wetlands? Can we recharge the aquifers? Have we got enough skills to restore rivers? Oh dear, at 5.30 this morning on BBC, they talked about the state of the rivers in Britain and called them sewers. Because when it rains heavily and there's been lots of rain, they open up everything that just pours in. You know, this is where permaculturists need to know what we need to be doing and how we need to be doing it. So I think there are areas that does not in any way um, contradict permaculture. So I haven't found anything else, but it has to absolutely complement it in ways that are future looking and deal with the problems of today. And then there's the social permaculture. I think we've got to understand swarm movements, Me Too movements. We've got to do a social sector analysis as a way we do a, an ordinary land sector analysis. Socially, what's coming in, what's going out, what are the losses, what do we want to keep, what do we want to go. It's done a bit in the bioregional inventory, but give it that parallel that we're living in a social ecosystem into a social. So, you know, I've thought about this long and hard um, uh, because I've been teaching in so many places, not because I particularly want to do it. I still, and I would change, cannot find anything that's better than permaculture. It's just the last 15 years have been an avalanche, absolute avalanche of new information. Every day through science and other networks, you find more. That it's not a matter of making it bigger. It's a matter of understanding the future to equip students and others better. I really see this last period, a lot of people have gone within, there's been a lot of time to reflect and connect with ourselves and those immediately around us. So I see effectiveness, you know, with people stepping up to becoming even more uh, actionaries in the unique context of their own life and community, you know, cultivating and sharing gifts, joining with other people in community to do group projects that bring benefit and just stepping back into being an active participant in the world around. Uh, permaculture philosopher Charles Eisenstein said the best way to invest any surplus that we have is into building community as it's the only truly resilient way to navigate an uncertain future. So maybe over to Maddie for the third question of how do we make all this work? How can people build momentum to create positive change? Well, I think, you know, we have to get back to the real practical <laughs> stuff that Rose talking about. And, and continue our scaling up and our, edu our lifelong education of all these ecological dimensions. And as you said, there's been this enormous growth of information and, and ideas in the last 20 years. Um, certainly during um, the first lockdowns of COVID last year, 
we we sold more books than than we ever have in a year um we we had more people logging on we had more people watching youtubes we just had a huge burst of activity and the the other thing i notice as a publisher and someone who deals with media is of course next you know new generations consume information and learn stuff very differently from previous generations so we permaculture in terms of you know where it's going needs needs to 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 be comfortable with all these other forms of expression and uh, and and communication that are constantly arising and changing in every decade um, and use those as tools rather than be alienated from them. But I think you said something of utter essence for me, Rosemary, which was about reciprocity, that, that we were always taught, you know, observe, interact and latterly observe and adapt because adaptation is the reality. We're not going to mitigate and prevent this incredible super tanker of climate change. Change is coming, um, whether we slow it down or not is another matter. Um, but also there's this other dimension of reciprocity. And, and I think it has to start with us. Uh, each individual needs to take the time to think about their effects, not only in terms of their actions and their consumerism, but also where we are as human beings. 30 years ago, when I first got involved with permaculture, there were hardly any women teachers. There were no creches for if you were a family with young children going to a, a convergence um, so that there, we weren't, this was in the UK, we weren't really set up to look after, you know, the, our babies. Um, during these educational events. I've seen that change enormously. Um, and uh, there being, you know, fabulous dimensions of children's education, which is just going to in increase and increase as those, that next generation is coming of age and having kids now um, and really gets it. Um, but, uh, but also we need to invite in all sorts of different types of people. We talk about diversity and inclusion, but we've really got to walk our talk. So, so we need to look at um, gender diversity and, and let's, let's face it, uh, racial diversity and decolonizing permaculture, which is something that is being talked about far more, but it's just the beginning of a very, very early conversation. Um, I was in Bristol on Sunday, which is always a place where you think very hard about colonialism, because of course that's where the African slaves left for the Caribbean and came back with the sugar cane and, and you know, other products grown in the colony. So, you know, it's something that you could just looking at the port and the River Severn and you you know, that historically, it's uh, something that we have to really look at, but, um, particularly us Europeans, because it's woven into our very thinking. Uh, and we're so unconscious about it, uh, how we've been brought up, even though I could actually come from an Anglo-Indian family, uh, which wasn't, uh, which was mixed race. Uh, it's just something that is just imprinted. So... I think, you know, where are we going? I hope that we're going into greater wisdom, greater understanding of where we've come from and our ancestry so that we can be aware of who we are in this present moment and change how things are for the, the unborn generations to come. So I think that we're going to um, take this view of listening and you know zone zero and the, the zero principle of which Sarah Kribleton was talking about 
uh, recently in Permaculture Magazine and on our YouTube channel of, of really beginning our permaculture design with actually listening to the voices of who was there before us in terms of the culture that we're entering, the, the place and, and its history so that we come with much bigger consciousness. And then I think if we're in that place of listening, we're much more capable of reciprocity. We're much more capable of accepting the feedback before we act um, and not kind of bustling in there with that sense of self-importance and fix it mentality, because we've got to face it. You, you know, you said it, Rosemary, permaculture can't fix everything but it's a really useful framework. Um, and I haven't found anything better yet either. I've tried. <laughs> oh, so have I, Maddie. I've, um, I've, looked, I've looked at organic gardening and diogenic. I've looked at them all. No one has come up with anything like it. No. And the other thing is what was started early between Bill and David, it's still solidly the muscles, it's there, it's the core from which we build. So if we add on, you know, cistern systems from dry lands or water marine gardens from Bangladesh or somewhere as the oceans rise, that doesn't change anything else about the core of permaculture. We're still dealing with water and food and climate and our houses and our trading systems. Nothing's changed. I don't know how to build momentum. I haven't got a clue, but what occurred to me is if we can get as many projects up as we can on the UN site, Maddie, maybe I can send you the document for a guide for everyone to do it so that they're flooded with them. What I think happening now, and it's due to COVID, and it's been quite extraordinary, and I was shocked. So the Philippines are ready to go ahead with another course, and then they couldn't, and I was going to help them write their own. Now, permaculture courses with people I'm engaged with are going to change. The Bangladesh will write theirs about rising seas, cyclones, floods. 25% of the land is less than, what is it, one metre? So it was going under. Dense housing, 5,000 slums in Dhaka. Mm. And how do you deal with them? So permaculture has to deal with these, and so do the permaculturalists. So what we've said is, Take your permaculture syllabus and then all the examples you give with each topic. So if you're dealing with domestic water, what can you do in your environment with this knowledge? What can you do on rural land with this knowledge? You will probably not be doing swales across the landscape. You may be doing something similar with a, with a hoe and different. How can you use this knowledge to suit the conditions of your country? So the global skeleton of permaculture remains but it's actually modified to deal with what that country sees is coming so sarah in the philippines has got a number of people who are absorbing this verbally and turning it into disaster and ethnic knowledge so she has people working for her who immediately speak it into the languages. There are about six languages in the Philippines, straight to people of ethnic origin who can write it and apply it themselves. So the two week course for people with the translator is changing very, very fast. And so is the work in Africa. So Morag on her mobile phone runs a PDC course with the most fabulous inputs and then someone takes that and broadcasts it or translates it simultaneously to a group of people. Or she's finding handheld, renewable, renewably charged battery projectors that they can show that video and that clip. They're still teaching permaculture, but it's so fast. The uptake is absolutely huge. Now, in a way, they're not waiting for someone to say, you are a qualified teacher, you've done your two years, you've done your designs, you're okay. Need is driving, necessity and need is driving this. And there's still permaculture courses. So when I'm working with Sarah and her, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? This is the next bit of the course that you could cover. 
because I don't want to dumb it down. I don't want to simplify it. I want people to have the lot. And it's the same with illiterate people in other countries. It, it's not a matter of that. It's a matter of how you teach it. And so what is happening now is that permaculture has escaped the confines of this academy or this association or this institute. And people where the need is great are now moving in and saying, with this technology and a little bit extra and a few dollars, we can have 50,000 people practicing some or all of it in various ways. So we will fund someone to leave one camp in Africa to go to another. And then they start up with the handheld projector or something, crowds come round. It may not be the PDC, but we're able to support those people with more information. Uh, when you look at what Narani did in Malaysia with that university and how the whole university sort of converted to permaculture, it's one of the few in the world, I think. But now the main trainers in the community are 14, 15, 16-year-old refugees from Myanmar. They're not Rohingya, they're Chan and Chong. And they are the ones who are teaching in their schools they set up for their kids. Where's it gone? It's escaped the confines of where it was originally set up to maintain quality and make sure it's true and it doesn't get something. But it's not going the way of yoga on the beach or permaculture in mud or permaculture with the bumps on my head. It's serving the needs of people who say, this is what we want. I think I was watching uh, Al Gore video recently and I thought we have to learn to teach like that. Not the talking voice on Zoom on and on, but actually teach as our Zoom teachers. We have to get behind with the resources and perhaps supply them. I think the explosion's happening, but it isn't recorded. That's why I'd like to get more people like Narani, like Sarah, like Bonnie Fast Hutton up there to talk about what they're doing because they're actually leading the world. It's not the two week course we're doing here in February. It is, they are running with it. They've left and they're not waiting for us to say yes or no, you can, you can't, it's gone. So, you know, what I think happening now is we'd better learn what they're doing and how they're doing it and see if we can take things away that are relevant and important. Well, you know, we're, we're carried forward by the force of our own momentum and those we align ourselves with in the world. And I've certainly been very motivated today listening to both of you talk. And I love that it's been so future oriented. Um, my mentor, Alison Gray said, try and make promises you don't know how you're gonna be able to keep. And to me, that's sort of about stretching the edges on how much good work, service, benefit that you can bring to the world around you. Uh, another big influence was Michael Becker, who is a middle school teacher in Hood River. He said, there's no perfect place or situation to do this work. Permaculture is not what we do once we find optimal conditions. Permaculture is the path to optimal conditions. So with this in mind, you know, we've been really future oriented this whole time, which is incredibly exciting and relevant for me. Maybe we could do one more question about you and your work. I mean, what's happening now and what's next in the work that you're doing? Maddie? So I'm at the moment living in a temp in with family in Somerset, um, having sold my uh, our family home where the kids grew up and we had a forest garden that we started planting in about 1993. And I am without a garden um, for the first time in years. Uh, possibly, I hope, moving to a patch of land um, in Devon and uh, developing, uh, working with that, but uh, much more it's, it's already in existence, so much more about learning um, about what's there and protecting the biodiversity rather than uh, restoring something. It's already very diverse and regenerative. Um, in terms of publishing, um, so I'm in my third decade of publishing and um, I'm really focused and keen on enabling younger people to to take it and run with it 
So I'm constantly developing our, our team um, uh, and bringing in new skills, new design skills, new technical digitaling, digital skills um, to just try and find ways of proliferating this message through the world and make it interesting and, and entertaining as well as educational for um, next generations. And that's really my focus um, in the last probably few years of my, my professional life, although I think I'll work for as long as I breathe. <laughs> well, I got sidetracked this year. Um, part of it, of course, was the dreadful situation in Afghanistan. So we just organised for two people to leave and that weekend, the Taliban moved in and they left at midnight as the Taliban moved in and went down to Pakistan. But what has happened, we've got our first permaculture refugees and they're all the people, nearly every one of them, 60, 70, I taught in Afghanistan and Kabul, are now either in hiding or they've gone to Iran or they're in Iraq and most of them are in great fear of their lives. They're both Shia, which is a threat, and Hazara. And Zara have always been persecuted. So they're without resources and without home and often moving and in touch with us. And we've been trying to support them and send money, working closely with Starhawk and some permaculturalists in um, USA, which has been marvellous because they've looked around and said, look, if people come here, we can find places for them because they're permaculturalists. But there will be other permaculturists refugees in the future. I don't know where from or how. At the moment, we can't get people out of Pakistan or Iran or Afghanistan, and they're heading in for one of the biggest famines. So I'm afraid I'm feeling really confronted by the number of problems that there are on the wall that we're hitting. Um, we're just starting a special fund, a Quaker fund, which will be responsive for emergency, but there may not even be food to buy. It's just the case of we may be hearing the death toll. And that is personally very confronting. On the other hand, we have also got people, permaculturists around the world. We've got some people, I don't know, Maya Evans, I think she's down around Bristol. She's a permaculturist peace activist from the peace activist group there, creative nonviolence, saying, look, if you can get people here, we'll help. We're also hoping to work a little bit with Costas and Lesvos. I mean, isn't it interesting? He was just one of the students and he's carried the project and started an institute and gone on. But you couldn't have written it into your project proposal. Maybe people can train on Lesvos and then be offered places as trainees on perhaps gen properties or farms throughout Europe, anywhere in all of Europe one or two people could go. So maybe this is a way that globally permaculture is able to support people and some of them in their greatest need. Um, you know, I can recommend them more personally, <laughs> but um, at the moment I'm living with this sense of great difficulty. I wish I could just get there, but I don't think it would help. So my sense is to try to build this community of support for permaculturists. Next time might be a major environmental disaster and understanding that disasters are probably going to cascade from now on. And therefore, couldn't we build up a community where someone's ready to say, I could take one or two people for up to six months, or I can give a young person some training, or I can. So I guess my head and heart, this has sort of been 24 hours a day, are in this little bit of a hard place. And Maddie, remember in England, I stood up and said, we need to work with refugees. My dream is to get the model of every refugee in every camp is able to learn permaculture under the auspices of the big INGOs, international NGOs, such as UNHCR, World Vision International, Red Cross, Red Crescent, are actually promoting this model for where they are and where they move to because people sit down and worry what's happening at home, what's happening at the family, did you get bad news, will we ever be able to go back? Permaculture is a distraction and an investment. 
and we're finding it's proven very, very good at the moment for people to sustain them to go forward. That's where my head is. Um, I've handed over permaculture refugees. We got some funding for a coordinator, Trudy Durinez, Australian Sri Lankan descent, worked in camps right through, 15 camps in Thailand, Myanmar, great skills, great ability. She was the gen coordinator. So um, I'm thrilled with her, and I think you'll hear more about her. So, but, you know, Maddie, you may decide to stop, but it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> I haven't managed so far. <laughs> yeah, you get that email or you get that contact or something and you're back in there at feet first into the water and off you go swimming again. So, um, yes, but the other thing is, although this is a hard situation, I'm never, ever despondent about what I have to offer or ever feel it was anything other than the best you could give people in those circumstances. And I think that's important because, you know, if I'd been a, a farmer, you know, sold on GM, I'd be regretting it now. There are no regrets in a permaculture life. Regret, you can't do more, but regrets for permaculture, no. Mm. Wonderful, thanks. Rosemary and Maddie, yeah, you both know I'm ever the optimist. And uh, I agree with Marianne Williamson, who said, our thoughts about the future go far towards creating it. Our minds and hearts are like filaments that connect today to tomorrow. They are conduits for either the status quo or the emergence of different, more loving possibilities. How we think and how we behave determine where we are going. So it's up to all of us. We're all connected together with life on the planet in this extraordinary journey. And may all our work bring benefit. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.